Welcome to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for February 19th, 2014. I'm Joanne Williams. This week we'll talk with members of the Community Advisory Board of the Felmers Cheney Correctional Center. The board helps ex-offenders reintegrate into their communities. We'll profile Dr. Wallace Cheatham, one of Milwaukee's music maestros. And we'll tell you who won the tickets to see The Whipping Man at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. We begin, though, with higher education and the ever-increasing cost of college. No matter which school you choose, college can be expensive. It's that time of year for College Goal Wisconsin. That's the information fair to help parents and students better understand their choices in getting financial aid. We're joined by our financial experts, Susan Tiering from Marquette University and Tamaya Cloyd from the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. You are the ladies who know all about the money to go to school. <laughs> and it's still out there, right? Yes, absolutely. Is there any more than there was in 2013? No, not really. Um, the, the dollars are really limited by um, some of the things that are happening in Congress. Although they did release the sequester for 1415, so that does mean that um, they had cut things back and now they look like they'll be about the same as they were in, in 13. But there's still plenty of money available. Oh, yes, Absolutely. definitely. For, for almost any student, what do you think? Well, one, there are, of course, student loans available. There's the federal Pell Grant if you qualify. And if you apply early enough, you may even qualify for state grants. How early is early enough? Early as soon as you file your taxes, if you're going to file. If you're not going to file, do the FAFSA January 1st. Okay, so we're, we're past January 1st. Mm -hmm. So now is still a great time. So, so go online and do it. Absolutely. Now. Do it tonight. Do it tonight. Do it right now while you're listening. <laughs> well, no, as soon as they finish listening. Yes. Absolutely. Um, for parents who are doing this for the first time, what's the advice that you give them? What's the basic things that they should do? Um, just come prepared. You need to have your federal PIN number for both yourself and the student that you're applying for. Read the questions thoroughly. They're pretty easy. Sometimes you just have to read the wording a few times. And one of the good things this year is we have the data retrieval tool. So you don't necessarily need to have your taxes in your hand. The IRS has a system built right into the FAFSA that will connect it. Now, when we talk about the FAFSA, that stands for federal... Free application for federal student aid. Okay. See, I could never remember exactly That's what okay. the F stood for. If, if someone is going to do that online, should they have their, their uh, tax returns right there with them? It certainly makes it easier mm -hmm. because when you look at the FAFSA application, it tells you exactly which line to look at on your tax return. So if you have them next to you while you're filling it out, it makes it, it, makes it go really quickly. If you're doing it for the first time, why do you have to do a FAFSA? Well, you have to do a FAFSA in order for the school to determine your eligibility. So that even includes student loans and other grants. That's the only way the school can determine what you qualify for. Uh, explain the difference between a loan and a grant and a scholarship. Loans you do have to pay back. Um, typically, they have an interest rate as well. So you have a six-month grace period. Pell Grants and some other grants, you typically do not have to pay those back in scholarships as well. Scholarships can come in-house from your college or an outside source. What comes first, choosing the college or university or getting the money to go there? Well, it depends on the type of school that you're planning to enroll at. If you're going to a open enrollment institution like a community college or a technical school, you can file the FAFSA right now and then make your decision where you're going to go. If you're going to a more selective school, some of those admission processes have already closed. So if, if the schools have closed their process and you really want to go there, is all lost or are there other options? Well, it's not all lost in terms of um, you can apply for second semester. So, but for, in terms of fall term, probably the admission process is closed in, in many more selective schools. Who can help parents and students do this? Uh, counselors in high school? Counselors in the high school can help you. They can call a financial aid office mm -hmm. where they think they're planning to enroll. Or of course, there's College Goal Sunday, which is a great uh, volunteer opportunity for families to come and get free assistance. Now, what's gonna happen at College Goal Sunday? We're actually going to help the students go ahead and complete their FAFSA applications right there on the spot. So that's one less thing the parents will have to do. That's always easier when mm -hmm. there's one less thing the parents will have to do. It's, it's really kind of daunting. You deal with it every day. Mm -hmm. But for parents who are doing this for the first time, should they be worried about this or is, is it possible to get money? It's definitely possible. 
exhaust all options, apply for outside scholarships, apply for in-house scholarships. Many times you can just simply check the school's website and they have scholarship options listed right on their websites. Some people think, oh, my son plays basketball or my son plays football or my daughter plays volleyball. Certainly they're going to get money to go to college. Is that guaranteed? It isn't guaranteed when they're looking for an athletic scholarship. It depends on the type of institution they're uh, hoping to enroll at. Mm -hmm. um, but you can file a FAFSA and always have the opportunity, depending on your financial circumstances, for loans, Pell Grants, state grants, and in some inst uh, institutions, uh, institutional dollars. How common is it to get a, a, an athletic scholarship? A lot of people think that just because my son or daughter is an athlete, they're going to get it. The funds are limited, so it's not very common. Um, they usually have a certain allotment of money that they're able to spend, so they may not have enough money to give to as many people as they would like to, so the funds are limited. Now, the, the College Goal uh, Fair is mm -hmm. coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to be there? Will you be helping? I won't be able to help this year. I'm disappointed. It's one of my favorite things to do. But um, there will be plenty of other financial aid professionals there, uh, volunteers from all across the state, really set this weekend aside to help mm -hmm. families. And families should be thinking that way, too. Set Absolutely. the weekend aside to do this. Yes. At what grade level in high school? Seniors, juniors, sophomores? Seniors who are planning to enroll in college should be working on their FAFSA mm -hmm. right now. So graduating seniors. Yes. Uh, juniors and younger students can either take advantage of net price calculators, which they can find on various college websites, or using the FAFSA forecaster, which will give you an idea of what you might qualify for, but it isn't the actual FAFSA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there are a lot of things on the internet that you can look at. Some of them are not really uh, going to offer you money, right? That's correct. How do you tell the real ones from the fake ones? I generally tell parents to try to stick to the ones that are given to them by the Department of Education so that you know that it is a genuine source. Or you can always contact your school with any questions if you're not sure if it's a scam. Mm -hmm. And the school you're interested in yes. or your high school? The school that you're interested in or your high school counselor will generally be able to assist you with that as well. Okay. Now what some people do make errors when they apply for funding. What are some of those? Oh, I think probably a couple of the most common ones are that they list the, their adjusted gross income and they put the exact same dollar amount as the amount of tax that they pay. Yes. That's a really common one. Oh. Another one that's very common is, as she mentioned, you need a PIN number, which is your electronic signature for both the parents and the students. So another common error is that they only put one PIN number in, maybe mm -hmm. just for the student and forget that the parent also needs to sign. And you, get, you create your own PIN number, too. That's yes. correct. That's something people may not realize. Mm -hmm. they, it doesn't just come from the government. You can choose what your PIN number is. Which is a great thing, because you can make it unique to something that you already have, an address, a PIN number for your debit card. Something easy. Something okay. easy to remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the fair is coming up, and Absolutely. people should be attending. When is it going to be? It's February 22nd and 23rd, College Goal, Wisconsin. So there's 29, states, or 29 sites around the state. And then new this year is an evening session, February 26th, a Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Okay. Thank you both for coming again. Thank you for having us. And good luck to everybody out there finding money for their kids to go to college. That's the big hurdle that parents have to face. Then there's in college, but that's a whole nother interview. Thank you both for coming and <laughs> joining you. us. Thank today. you. Dr. Wallace Cheatham is a familiar sight in Milwaukee's music community. He's been music director for a number of churches in the area, as well as for the new Jubilee Community Choir, which is seen here. But what you may not know is that he is an accomplished composer and music scholar whose works have been performed on five continents. There are probably more people in England that know more about what I'm doing than there are here. I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of composition. And uh, most recently, my first uh, symphonic score, full symphony, was that I composed in 1986, was just published. Uh, symphony number no. one. The symphony is my second full orchestral composition published by Jomar Press.
Here's a sample of his suite for sax soprano and organ. When did you know that music was going to be a very important part of your life? Well, my mother put me on the piano when I was eight years old. And uh, she was my first piano teacher. But our relationship as teacher and student was very short-lived. And, uh, but I think I always knew that I would be doing something in music from that time. I never thought, though, by any stretch of the imagination that I would have the kind of career that I have been blessed to have, and certainly not uh, the international kind of thing. I knew that I would be ex uh, involved in my community. That community was initially in Tennessee, where he attended Knoxville College. I am a graduate uh, class of 1967 of Knoxville College. It's one of the historic, historic black colleges that uh, was started by the Presbyterian Church. Uh, I had a very exciting four years at Knoxville College. Uh, my first international trip happened before my senior year. In uh, the summer of 1966, I went to Kenya and spent uh, 10 weeks there as a part of Operation Crossroads Africa. Operation Crossroads Africa is still going very strongly. And about five or six years, to, years ago, that organization uh, celebrated its 50th anniversary. And that was held at uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. And I was honored to have been asked to be the organist for that service. He has also received accolades from his college alma mater. I have been honored twice by Knoxville College, once by the Alumni Association, uh, outstanding graduate of national prominence, and then a couple of years ago, I was inducted into the College Hall of Fame. After graduating from Knoxville College, he started his career teaching music in the public school system. I taught in three systems. I taught for a year at home in Knoxville at a time when they were first beginning to racially integrate the schools. And I taught at a school, two schools, between two schools, where I was the only black teacher on the faculty. And there were no black students in either school. And uh, the principal at one of them, she was not very kind to me. So I found myself getting out of there. He came to Wisconsin, taught in Racine for a few years, and then moved to Milwaukee where he taught for 30 years. But teaching music wasn't enough. I knew, though, I knew that I could never be completely fulfilled as a musician just by teaching in the public schools. I knew that early on. I became interested in opera and the African-American experience when I had the privilege to study with Robert McFerrin. Uh, Robert McFerrin, uh, Bobby McFerrin's father, uh, he was the first African-American to become a regular member of the Metropolitan Opera Company. This was in 1955. His career, though, at the Met was really sh short-lived overall because there was really nowhere for him to go there as a black man, and that's something that hasn't changed that much to this day, 50-plus years later. His book, Dialogues on Opera and the African American Experience, grew out of that research. It features interviews with 10 classically trained musicians 
who shared their stories of finding success in a music genre that traditionally treated their race with disdain, hostility, and skepticism. I had a very difficult time finding a publisher for the book. And one of the university presses, I think I have the letter somewhere now buried under my pile, uh, that they wouldn't publish it, wouldn't even consider publishing it, because opera was not itself, the, the genre of opera was not a part of black culture. And they went on to tell me that they would not consider even publishing such a book because they would never be able to market it. And now that book is being recognized by other publishers and it is housed in libraries all over the world. Recently, he wrote the foreword to Nigerian poet Matthew Umukoro's second book of poetry. He had written music to underscore some of the poems in Umukoro's first book. Matthew Umukoro is really a, a just a poetic genius, uh, and his command of English is just tremendous. He is a professor at the University of Ibadan in Ibadan, Nigeria. We've never met, but I feel, I think, I think he does too, that we have known each other uh, all of our lives. His devotion to music is matched only by his devotion to his family. I have been married to the same pretty lady for 43 years. And uh, we have two grown children. Uh, we now have two grandsons. And his love of the Milwaukee area. I have just stayed here, continued to work here, and found other ways to uh, get out my work out. And, and that, that has worked fine for me. In a recent report, the National Institute of Justice says that the inmate population in the United States is about 2.4 million people, and African Americans and Hispanics make up two-thirds of that population. The reincarceration rate for people of color is three times higher than that for whites. Our guests are working to lower that rate. Joining us are doctors R.L. McNeely and Stan Stoykovic from the Felmers Cheney Correctional Center Community Action Board. Advisory board. Ad advisory <laughs> board, which means that you help the center run or you help the center help the people who are in incarceration. Well, it really means that uh, what we do is to help reinstate reinforce the desirable rehabilitation goals of the uh, center, the correctional center. But in addition, we are advocates uh, making efforts to suggest, encourage new policies by Department of Corrections and uh, legislation in the state uh, that would be useful in terms of that whole area of, of endeavor. We recently had a report uh, telling us that of the 50 states, Wisconsin had the highest rate of black men in prison of all 50 states. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you, or does it? No, it doesn't surprise me. We've actually known about this. We've known about particular areas in the city of Milwaukee, for example, where large numbers of young men, largely young African-American men, and then to some degree Hispanic men or Latino men as well, going to prison disproportionately. This is not a new statistic. Uh, this has been something that has plagued, I think, the, uh, the state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee, and the county of Milwaukee for many, many decades, actually. So it's a very, very sad kind of uh, situation. I would think both of you are familiar with that. Why isn't the rest of the population or the rest of society or the rest of Milwaukee as familiar with that? And why isn't there some hue and cry to get that changed? Well, well, I'm gonna, uh, let me just make one quick comment. I want to put some of that in perspective. And what I would say is half of the men 
black men in Milwaukee County have had some exposure to state correctional facilities. That's half of those over the age of 30. That's, what word would you use, dismal? That's disheartening, dismal, tragic, and doesn't have to be. The fact of the matter is we pass legislation both at the state level as well as the federal level to get tough on crime back in the 80s and 90s. There were many of us at that point in time who said this will lead, this is a train wreck. And the train wreck is really the community. It's impact on the community, particularly families, and the impact on families when, when a father, disproportionately a father, winds up going to prison and going to prison for a long period of time, largely around drugs. And the distribution, the possession, the delivery, the sale of illegal narcotics has been a major driver of the incarceration policies. But we knew early on that this was going to happen. What, didn't anybody listen to you? No, I had people actually at the state <laughs> level tell me directly when I asked, when truth and sentencing went into effect on January 1st, 2000, I had asked, has there been an impact statement done? Not only an economic impact, but a racial impact statement of this before we actually implement this. And I was told it was not necessary. By the way, that's in direct violation of policy that you have to do an impact statement on these legislative actions, especially one like this, where the profound impact on the community. But I was told very directly by some legislators, we know it works. I'm not sure what it is, but it works, and therefore we're going to do this. Senator Nakia Harris and Representative Sandy Pash currently have legislation. I think there was a show where you recently had Nakia Harris uh, talking about that, that proposed legislation. It is meeting some resistance right now in the state legislature, and we're hoping that people call in to their legislator to encourage them to pass this legislation. It's very important. Important, and I don't want to, to have this point missed about the impact of this disparate incarceration on African Americans. What it's doing is it's destroying black communities. It's destabilizing, decimating, and destroying black communities and black families. And it's not due to tremendous disparate, uh, disp disparate uh, uh, rates of involvement in crime. What we're talking about here are minor drug arrests ending up in incarceration. We're talking about discriminatory treatment from police arrest decisions to prosecute uh, through the court system with uh, sentences all the way through even to the uh, parole agents. Is this, is this such a big issue that it's hard to get your hands around? Should it be approached one small part at a time? Or should we go after the whole system to change it? Well, it's systemic, but the research on this has revealed that the most profound impact is that police behavior, is how police make decisions regarding arrest. That you can explain about 50, in some cases, 60 percent of the change or the variation in differences among offenders relative to police behavior. The fact of the matter is there are six to eight zip codes in the state of, excuse me, in the city of Milwaukee that have consistently contributed prisoners to the state prison system. Milwaukee alone contributes almost 50 percent, Milwaukee County, of if, all prisoners. If it's police behavior, what does the police department have to say? That is a very good question. And in fairness to the police department, you know, we hire them to do a specific job. <laughs> But the fact is that the impact on who we arrest, our enforcement policies, where we enforce the law, we know the differential treatment that occurs just by jurisdiction, by where people live, has an in particular impact, particularly in the drug offenses. We know, for example, that the usage of illegal drug uses cuts across all socioeconomic, all racial groups, all ethnic groups, yet the vast majority of criminal arrest Prosecution, conviction, and sentencing is in the African-American community. So tell me, what kind of hope is there? Very briefly, what well, is the hope? Well, let me tell you this. It's not just the police. It's also the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections, there are any number of ways in which their policies could be improved, and then there would be beneficial effects to the entire state. This isn't just something that bothers black families and black communities, research shows that when you have these sort of uh, disparate outcomes, that it has uh, repercussions all the way through, all the way to the outlying area. Our suburban areas would be a lot more 
uh, vigorous in terms of the pro economic prosperity if we didn't have this sort of thing. At least that's what research shows. Well, we're going to have to leave. Sort of disparity. We're going to have to leave our conversation right there. But I hope you do come back because this is an issue we want to touch on at least one or two more times to see if we can get more information out and maybe have an impact. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Before we close tonight, here's the question we asked last week. She was the first slave to escape to freedom using Wisconsin's Underground Railroad. What was her name? The answer is Caroline Quarles. And here are the four viewers who will receive tickets to see The Whipping Man at the Milwaukee Rep. It runs through March 16th, 2014. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Good night.